There are words that we never forget saying. The first time that you say your child's name, when you name your child, that sticks with you, right? It's, you're saying something that will, will have lifelong implications. When you stand in front of God and God's people and you look at another person and you say, I do, whew, you just got married, right? It, it just happened with those two words. So you say those words and it happens. I've never personally been on trial and hope not to be, but I, I assume that standing in front of a court and saying not guilty or guilty, that you're not going to forget that either. There are words we say that have power to them. There are words that we hear that have power to them. Any other words come to mind? You start thinking about words that have power? Any other words you will never forget? I pledge allegiance. The pledge. What other words might you come? might there be? Lord's Prayer. Lord's Prayer. You ever going to forget the last words of your parents or your grandparents? What, what were they? What were, their, what were those last words? Right. You don't forget them, do you? Whatever they were. There are so many words that matter, but when it comes to last words, if there's any one set of words that we will do whatever we can to honor. That's them, right? We will honor last words. We will honor their people's wishes, their desires. With that in mind, the importance of last words. What are Christ's last words to the church? Not the last words on the cross. That, that was an Easter a few Easter's ago. I'm talking about the last words that Jesus gives to the church before they begin the journey across the centuries. The last words are what we find in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, in the last two chapters. That we, that's, what, that's what we read a few minutes ago. We read that the last words of Christ to his church are, first, to talk about the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem coming down, and that all who have been forgiven, all who have accepted Jesus as Lord, have this place, have a place in the New Jerusalem to come. And then the, sec the, the very last chapter talks about the leaves for the tr for the, from the tree for the healing of the nations. Those are the last things that Christ talks about, his last words for the church before we begin our centuries-long journey of following him. Those are the words for us today we're going to be looking at. and We're going to start with those words about the New Jerusalem, king, the kingdom of God coming to earth. The New Jerusalem, when, it, when Revelation 21 talks about the New Jerusalem coming down, we're talking about the re renovation of all that is, the creation of all, the recreation that all that has, has ever been made. This is what Paul is talking about when he talks about those who have fallen asleep in the Lord, his way of talking about death. Those who have fallen asleep in the Lord will rise to new life, as all those who have accepted Jesus and have accepted his forgiveness are welcomed into the life and the kingdom to come. And this is how we tend to think about Jesus, right? We talk, think about the kingdom to come, heaven, down the road. We tend to think of that and that Jesus' role is as judge. Jesus is the one who declares whether we have a place in the kingdom to come, that if we have accepted the gift of forgiveness, if we accept that, then we, we do have this, this place. The one who dies for the sins of humanity from the cross declares, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And that is the moment at which Jesus, the one who is judge, the one who has ultimate authority, for, that's when we are saved by Christ. When he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. If you want to know when you were saved, that's it. You were saved 2,000 years ago when Christ said those words. You've accepted the offer. We each accept that offer at different points in our lives. But that's when salvation began. It's just our choice when we choose to unwrap it. So the one who is judged offers forgiveness to all of us who have sinned. And so, and so Jesus is our judge. He offers forgiveness. He determines what happens after death. He determines whether we will have a place in the kingdom of God. And we make that decision whether we confess that we have fallen short, whether we are sinners, and accept that we need this, this gift of forgiveness. And so maybe today that's what the good news you need to hear. Maybe today the good news you need to hear is that the one with ultimate authority, the judge of all that ever has been and ever will be, declares you innocent, declares you forgiven. <clears throat> 
Such that the second we accept that, we are accepting this gift of having a place in the kingdom to God, of God. Maybe you need to know that there is no sin, no fault, no error, no act of commission or omission that could ever separate you from the love of God. And if that's what you need to hear today, then hear the good news. My friends, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love towards us. In the name of Christ, the one who has authority to judge, you are forgiven. You're going to hear those words again a little bit later. You'll hear them every time you're here on a Sunday. But I want you to hear them multiple times today. I want you to hear them from me. And I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell each other, you are forgiven. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you're forgiven right now. To your other neighbor. And behind you. And to everyone around you, you are forgiven. Sometimes we need to hear that again and again and again until it sinks in and permeates and we can truly believe. You are forgiven. There's no mistake, no past, no decision that can keep any one of us from being welcome here and welcome at this table. You are forgiven. Jesus has judged us and you are forgiven. All right. That's one part of the good news. That's the first part of the good news and it's very good, but it gets better. It gets far better. Because what, what begins with forgiveness, there's always a second part in Scripture. There's always what happens next. <coughs> what happens is forgiveness always is followed by healing. There's forgiveness and healing, two sides of the same coin. You can go all the way back to the founding of, of the temple, the beginning of the nation of Israel, and when Solomon finished build, building the temple, God shows to, up to him that night and says, I will accept this table, this will be where I dwell. And when my people come to this table and humble themselves and pray and confess their sins, I will forgive their sins and I will heal the land. Forgiveness and healing back to back. You don't get one without the other. You are forgiven and you are healed. This is the theme throughout the Old Testament. And it then shows up again and again in the life of Jesus. Jesus is gathering a bunch of people to teach them. It's in Mark 2. He's in Capernaum. He's healing, bringing together a bunch of people to teach them. And there are four friends who have a fifth friend who, who's paralyzed, so they put him on a stretcher. And they're trying to get him through the crowd, and they can't get through the crowd. And so they go, they knock a hole in the roof. That's, that's impressive. That's the love of a friend. I'm willing to knock a hole in the roof for you. And so they knock a hole in their roof, and they drop this dude down in front of Jesus. And Jesus, seeing their faith, says, You are forgiven! And there are some scribes there who are going, oh, only, only God has the power to do that. And so Jesus says to them, to show you that I have the authority to do this, I can forgive, I'm also going to heal. Get up, take your mat, and walk. Right? Forgiveness and healing, back to back. That's how they belong. Forgiveness and healing, two sides of the same coin. Right after this, Jesus tells his disciples, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Sick and sinners. Are, they're, they're, that's the same thing to be sick and to be a sinner. It's the same thing. And Jesus comes to save us from both. If you think of that word, save... Right? What, what do we usually say when, mean when we say Jesus saves? If you're going to tell someone Jesus saves, what are you usually thinking about? Forgiving sin, right? We're thinking of Jesus as judge. But the word save, it, it's sozo in Greek. It's not just what Jesus does. It's not just what a judge does. It's what a doctor does. And we still use that today. When you go to the doctor, if it's a really bad situation, what do you ask? Can you save him? Right? It's the same word. Saving from sin and saving and healing. It's all the same thing. It's wrapped up together. So <clears throat> while we tend to focus on forgiveness, on having a place in this new Jerusalem, that's not the wholeness of the good news for the day. Jesus is our judge who declares us forgiven. But after judging us forgiven, he takes off the black robes of a judge and puts on the white coat of a doctor and then begins to heal begins to heal us for the ways that we are broken. This is what we see in Jesus' ministry. He forgives and then the blind see. He forgives and then the paralyzed walk. He forgives and then fevers are healed, lives are restored, demons are cast out. Once we accept Jesus as our judge, he then wants to be our doctor. And he's the finest doctor we can have. For in following him in his footsteps, we don't just find healing of our bodies. 
healing of our minds. We also find healing of all parts of our lives. Lives which might have seemed random and useless find purpose. Addictions are tamed. Past scars and sins fade. Forgiveness blooms, and as we are healed as followers of Jesus Christ, gracefulness and patience and peace become how we live, not just the exception. For as we follow him, we grow to resemble him, to be more Christ-like day after day. And it's not just individual lives. When Jesus talks about saving, it's not just forgiving sins. It's not just healing individuals. It's the healing of families. Anyone have brokenness in your family? Following Christ together heals broken families. It heals shattered communities. It brings churches back to life. Churches that have floundered follow Jesus again and find new hope in a future. We never forget following Jesus. Team sport, right? You don't follow, Jesus doesn't call a disciple. He calls disciples so that you can love your neighbor in the pew next to you. Following Jesus, it's a team sport. And Jesus is offering to heal that team. And it doesn't end there, for when we look at the last words of Revelation, Jesus doesn't say, I give you the leaves of the tree for the healing of the community. It's not the church, it's not your family, it's the leaves for the tree of the healing of the nations. And you might think to yourself, that's kind of bold, isn't it? Healing the nations, right? It was bold when it was first written down in the year 94 AD, written to seven beleaguered, persecuted churches in Asia Minor. That's who it was first written to. And it is just as bold today. Our task is to go out and to be part of Christ's ministry of healing families, churches, communities, and even nations. And so when we are sent forth this day, when you receive the benediction and you go out, we all go out and have our very tasty meals. Afterwards, we are not sent out as forgiven people who can now kick back until kingdom come. We're not sent out as forgiven people who will just have to endure whatever might come our way. We are sent out as forgiven people who are sent out to be healed and to heal others, even a nation. Forgiveness is the beginning of our journey following Jesus. Healing is what the journey looks like day after day. Forgiveness is how we start. Healing is then what, what we do day after day. My friends, Jesus was dead and now he lives and there's no problem that's bigger than that. If Jesus can get over being dead, there's nothing we can face that is insurmountable. And he is the one who opens the door for us to follow him into the kingdom to come. And so the good news for you this day is that you are forgiven by the judge who has authority to declare it. You are forgiven. And the good news doesn't cease. You are not just forgiven, but healing is offered. You are offered healing. What is broken can be made whole. What is bent can be made straight, whether it is a person, a body, a life, a family, a community, or even a nation. Hear the good news. Christ is not just our judge to forgive us. He is our doctor who, to heal us. That is the good news of Easter, the last words that Christ gives to his church. You are forgiven and go forth and you will be healed. Thanks be to God. Amen.